Well, hi, everyone. Um, welcome to tonight's webinar, The Urgent Case for a Mega Dairy Moratorium in Oregon. And we're really excited to be here with you tonight to share some information about the mega dairy crisis in Oregon and the solution, which are some mega dairy moratorium bills that have been introduced in both the Oregon House and Senate for the 2021 legislative session. And we'll answer some of the many questions you all submitted and talk about how you can get involved. I'm Emma Newton, an organizer with Food and Water Watch and the Stand Up to Factory Farms Coalition. And we'll get started in just a minute, um, but I wanna give a, folks a chance to hop on. And if you are at your computer, we highly recommend clicking the link to join the video. You'll be able to see some of us through the program we're using called Zoom. We will email around the recording to everyone who signed up in the beginning um, afterwards. So don't worry if you cannot in fact join with video. And the recording will also be available on our Facebook Live. So we'll just give it a moment here. Um, we know this is really anticipated and we're excited to dive in in just a minute. All right, well, we have a lot of ground to cover tonight, so I'm gonna get started here. Um, and again, I just wanted to welcome everyone to the webinar, The Urgent Case for a Mega Dairy Moratorium in Oregon. And we're going to dive in to hear all about the mega dairy moratorium bills in the Oregon legislature and the impacts these industrial facilities have on Oregon. But first, I'm Emma Newton with Food and Water Watch and the Stand Up to Factory Farms Coalition. And we have a really fantastic lineup of speakers with us tonight. Um, who I'll introduce shortly. Before we get started, I'll just give you a quick orientation if you're using a, if you're joining us on Zoom. We're here on video and you'll be able to see all of the speakers as they share if you click the link you received in your email. But don't worry, we can't see you. We will be keeping everyone on mute to cut down on background noise, but if you have a question at any point in the presentation, you can click the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and we'll get to as many of those as we can throughout um, the webinar. We are starting with the questions you wrote in when you RSVP'd, so bear with us as we try to answer the most asked ones first. And I'll also note that we will not be using the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen, so again, just click the Q&A if you want to ask a question. But first, I wanted to introduce you to the Stand Up to Factory Farms Coalition. Um, the Stand Up to Factory Farms Coalition is a diverse group of local, state, national, and environmental food safety, animal welfare, small farming, and rural community organizations. And we're all concerned about the harmful impacts of mega dairies on Oregon. The coalition comprised of these groups you see here are seeking legislation establishing a moratorium on new mega dairies and the expansion of existing mega dairies until policies are in place that meaningfully protect our air, water, and climate and ensure the humane treatment of animals and the economic viability of family farms. Um, and I'm really excited to have some of our coalition members here with me tonight. So with me tonight is Amy Van Son, senior attorney with the Center for Food Safety. And the Center for Food Safety is a member group of the coalition. Also with me tonight is Tara Heinzen, legal director at Food and Water Watch. And we're hoping to have a special guest um, here later in the evening who I will introduce as soon as they're able to join us. And though Abby Munoz, a community member from Boardman, Oregon and Oregon Rural Action um, member could not be with us tonight, she has shared a video with us that we'll be showing in a little bit, speaking to her community's experience living with mega dairies. So remember, if you have any questions that come up during the speaker's presentations tonight, you can place them in the Q&A chat box. For many on this call, you know that Oregon is a unique and special state. And for those that don't know, I can assure you it definitely is. Oregonians have a deep sense of place. We value our vibrant rural communities and small farmers, have strong humane values, and believe in protecting our home, including our air and water, for generations to come. But mega dairies are mega polluters that harm animal welfare, drive small farmers out of business, pollute our air and drinking water, drain our water resources, and harm our rural economies. Simply put, mega dairies don't belong in Oregon. Now, 2020, 2020 <laughs> was so tough. It was such a tough year, and it really unveiled the crises we face. In Oregon, we experienced a global pandemic that hit our rural communities. 
including the predominantly Latinx agricultural communities of Umatilla and Morrow County particularly hard. We experienced devastating climate-driven wildfires that decimated whole communities and choked the air with ash for weeks. And we saw Oregonians show up for racial justice and equity despite federal interference. And in the face of these challenges, in Oregon across the country, we're seeing increasing calls to address the harms of industrial animal agriculture on our climate, air, water, and rural communities. From the growing support for the Farm System Reform Act, a federal bill that would phase out factory farming, to agriculture saturated states like Iowa, where a moratorium campaign on new factory farms is gaining momentum, we're seeing an increased urgency to stop the harms of these facilities. And Oregon agriculture is really at a crossroads. We currently have one of the largest mega dairies in the country with nearly 70,000 cows near Boardman, Oregon, and are anticipating a permit for another 30,000 cow facility, Easter Day Farms, just a few miles down the road on the former site of the disastrous Lost Valley mega dairy. Without meaningful regulatory protections in place from the harms of these facilities, mega dairies are free to turn Oregon into the next epicenter of mega dairy pollution. This is why we need a timeout on the permitting of these facilities. It's time for a mega dairy moratorium. And you'll hear from expert to, experts tonight on the impacts of these facilities and what it means for our state and for our communities. But before I hand it over to them, I wanna make an exciting announcement. You can join us in taking action to protect Oregon from mega dairies right now. For the first time, we have mega dairy moratorium bills introduced in both the House and the Senate for the 2021 legislative session. These bills would place a moratorium on permitting new and expanding facilities above 2,500 cows until meaningful regulations are in place to protect our air, water, rural communities, climate, small farmers, and animal welfare. Senator Michael Denbro from District 23 um, introduced Senate Bill 583, which has been assigned to the Senate Energy and Environment Committee. And Representative Rob Nose, District 42, has introduced House Bill 2924 that has been assigned to the House Agricultural and Natural Resources. While this is incredibly exciting news, we know that we need to keep the pressure up to stop the harm from mega dairies and make sure these bills make it through committee and onto the chamber floor for a vote. It'll take all of us to protect Oregon from this extractive and harmful industry. And that's where you come in. We'll have information at the end of this webinar about how you can get involved and stand with us as we fight for our air, water, climate, rural communities, small farmers, and animal welfare. So stay tuned until the end for some important opportunities to take action. And with that, I'll turn it over to our first speaker, Amy Van Son. Amy is a senior attorney at the Center for Food Safety's Portland, Oregon office. After clerking for CFS in law school, Amy joined CFS as an attorney in 2015. As part of CFS's legal team, Amy practices environmental and administrative law to defend farmers, communities, and the environment from industrial animal factories, aquaculture, genetically engineered crops and animals, and the overuse of toxic pesticides, especially in the Pacific Northwest. Amy also works to protect the integrity of organic and ensure the transparent labeling of genetically engineered foods. Prior to joining CFS, Amy served as a volunteer attorney with Earth Justice, working on animal factories on the East Coast. So welcome, Amy. Thank you. And thanks to all of our participants for joining tonight. Um, really excited to be able to have this way to communicate with folks despite us all uh, or many of us being stuck in our homes. Uh, but I would like to start today by talking about some of the specific impacts from mega dairies. And I don't have time to talk about every single one. So I'm gonna focus on a couple of highlights. Uh, first, uh, there is pollution impacts. So starting with climate, uh, cows and their manure uh, emit methane and nitrous oxide, both of which are greenhouse gases and are much more powerful than carbon dioxide. Livestock production is in fact the leading source of greenhouse gas methane in the United States. And the management of manure that takes place on mega dairies and other factory farms is one of the top sources of methane emissions um, in 2018 and uh, keep increasing. It's in fact one of the areas that keeps increasing emissions as opposed to other types of industrial activities that are decreasing their emissions. Uh, dairy operations are a big part of this because of the methane that comes from cows. 
And in Oregon, agriculture is the leading source of methane. Unfortunately, in the latest executive order from uh, Governor Brown to deal with this climate crisis, emissions from mega dairies was not at all specifically addressed. And there are other air quality impacts as well um, to the health of people working and living around these facilities. Again, that manure as it decomposes is emitting large amounts of toxic air pollutants, things like ammonia, hydrogen sulfide, and particulate matter. And these are known to cause respiratory symptoms and diseases, for example, uh, asthma in children, and to harm people's quality of life. Further, um, ammonia emissions cause haze. And in Oregon, the concentration of mega dairies near the Columbia Gorge is causing a regional haze due to these ammonia emissions that is harming the Columbia River Gorge National Scenic Area, one of our very special places in the state. Um, in addition to that, this is a both kind of pollution and community health aspect. Uh, mega dairies generate, again, a lot of manure um, and a lot of therefore nutrients in that manure. And you know, in the right quantities, uh, nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus are fertilizer for plants. But in the enormous quantities that these dairies generate, uh, it tends to be over applied to the fields where it's essentially disposed of. And that results in nitrates leaching into groundwater. Um, they can also seep from unlined lagoons. Um, these are the big pits in the ground, cesspits of uh, wastewater and manure. And they can also run off into surface water. Um, in Oregon, where we have the, the largest mega dairy and a second proposed uh, largest, second largest proposed mega dairy, um, they're both in or near the groundwater management area that was designated uh, decades ago now uh, for unsafe amounts of nitrates in the groundwater there, which is also drinking water. And the high levels of nitrates can cause all sorts of latent or long-term health harms, including cardiovascular issues like strokes, uh, reproductive problems like miscarriages and even cancers. Uh, so this kind of drinking water pollution from factory farms has actually been likened to rural America's own private Flint, as in the water crisis in Flint, Michigan. Uh, many residents in the area of Oregon that this is affecting can't afford the water filtration technology that you would need to remove nitrates in your home from your drinking water. And nitrates are odorless, colorless, and flavorless. So you don't know if you have them. And boiling your water actually makes it worse um, because it concentrates them. So this is a major public health crisis um, that is underlying uh, our current ongoing pandemic. Um, further, I want to highlight the impacts to small farmers and small or mid-sized farmers and these small businesses in Oregon. Uh, the consolidation and overproduction of these massive dairies floods the market with cheap milk, uh, making it impossible for smaller dairies to compete. Uh, Oregon's, we've seen this in Oregon because our small and mid-sized dairies have declined significantly since uh, 1999 uh, when Three Mile Canyon began operating. And we've lost family uh, smaller and mid-sized dairies at, at a rate of nine dairies per month between 2002 and 2007. Um, so it's a, it's a huge decline in the ability of these small businesses to stay afloat. Uh, with the increase in you know, demand for milk worldwide and exports for that from the US and competition from places around the world like New Zealand, this problem of consolidation and increased production uh, and mega dairies coming to Oregon is really an imminent problem. This isn't something that's theoretical or far in the future. Um, and I would like to highlight that small and mid-sized operations are more able to actually pasture their herd of cows, um, you know, easier to give more attention to, to the animals when you have fewer of them. By, while by contrast, uh, large corporate owned farms are sending, you know, money and profits out of, the lo out of local communities, you know, the same way as any large, um, you know, corporate entity operates versus smaller uh, local businesses. So, um, you know, how does this affect Oregon and, and why is this a problem right now? Um, and, and what's this new dairy that's proposed? So in 2016, over the objection of thousands of Oregonians, the state permitted uh, the second largest mega dairy, Lost Valley, for 30,000 cows 
to open up down the road from Three Mile Canyon, which is the largest at 70,000 cows. And Lost Valley immediately began violating this permit. And the state assured us that it was the best permit it had ever written and there would be no problems and no water quality impacts. But um, again, violations started immediately and after racking up 200 of these violations, the state finally revoked the permit, something that Stand Up to Factory Farms called for in 2018. But it cost the taxpayers hundreds of thousands of dollars to inspect and enforce that permit. Uh, Lost Valley was put up for auction as the owner claimed bankruptcy and purchased by Easter Day LLC, which is a family um, a farm operation out of Washington that operates a very large beef feedlot there. Uh, but the Easter Days are first time mega dairy operators and they are proposing to reopen the Lost Valley facility at nearly the same number of cows, 30,000. And for reference, 700 cows is the federal definition of a large dairy. So we're talking about orders of magnitude bigger. And if opened, this dairy would produce the equivalent waste of a small city and use massive amounts of groundwater in an area where that fresh water is scarce and getting scarcer. So um, I also wanna highlight that Lost Valley, while they were disastrous and very poorly managed, <laughs> was not uh, just a lone uh, problem. And uh, my colleague is gonna speak to this a little bit more later, but you know, while Lost Valley was an egregious example of very poor management, uh, the fact is that the state welcomed the owner in with open arms um, and took extraordinary efforts to actually close it down once it started violating. Uh, including taking the uh, facility, taking the owner to court with all these lengthy court proceedings and then revoking the permit with the administrative proceedings. So it was not your typical um, effort it takes. And that would happen with any kind of facility. Now, uh, you know, Three Mile Canyon is the largest, but it's not the only mega dairy in the state. And the issue is really that these dairies generate so much waste that even small problems can cause major environmental and public health threats. And I wanna finish uh, by saying, calling attention to, you know, this is a, it's a rural issue for the people that are living near these facilities, but we should all care about it. Most of Oregon's population uh, is lucky enough not to live next to a mega dairy, and that is by design. Um, you know, these facilities, for example, I'll, I'll use Three Mile Canyon as an example because it's the largest. Uh, they have the same acreage as the entire city of Portland. Um, so folks obviously would not tolerate that kind of operation in a more wealthy and populated area, uh, hence why it is out in uh, rural Oregon. Um, and, uh, but it, you know, it makes those communities that are surrounding it you know, a sacrifice in the name of cheap milk. It's, it's not cheap, it's just the costs are externalized. Um, but, you know, we're consuming uh, these products from these facilities. So, you know, not just on your morning cereal, but uh, Tillamook Cheese, the beloved Oregon company, sources the majority of its milk from mega dairies, including Three Mile Canyon and was buying from Lost Valley before it shut down. And uh, we'll also say climate change affects all of us. As Emma pointed out, um, either this summer you might have been running for your life or choking on, on smoke, even here in, in, in Portland where I am. Uh, and, you know, as does the degradation of our special places in Oregon, like the Columbia Gorge. So I think we need to ask ourselves, do we want to be another factory farm state? Or do we want to be the kind of state that values our air and our water and our earth as much as the people producing our food, the animals and the communities surrounding them? I think what we really want and need is a local and resilient food system that is just uh, and not one that allows massive polluting factory farms to be put in marginalized communities. So I will wrap up there and um, thank you all again. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, you were absolutely right. Uh, I think it's incredibly important to remember that these facilities are just fundamentally unsustainable because of their sheer size and um, the issues that that causes. Um, I did wanna give folks a quick reminder again um, that we'll be emailing out the recording to this webinar as well as any additional resources we cover. So if you have any questions for Amy, be sure to pop them in the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And before we uh, share our uh, video from Abby Munoz um, from 
uh, Boardman, Oregon, I wanted to quickly introduce um, a very special guest we have with us tonight, uh, Representative Rob Nose. Uh, the lead sponsor on our House Bill 2924 uh, uh, moratorium on new and expanding mega dairies above 2,500 cows. And we'll get to hear from um, Rep Nose here in a minute, but I just wanted to give a quick shout out to introduce uh, him as well as thank him for being on here tonight. So um, with that, I'd like to share a short video from community member Abby Munoz. And Abby is a board member and leader with Oregon Rural Action, um, a member of the Stand Up to Factory Farms Coalition. Abby has lived in Eastern Oregon for 32 years. When she moved to Umatilla, she worked in the surrounding fields, sowing and harvesting strawberries and potatoes. She and her husband have raised two daughters. And for the past 11 years, Abby has worked with parents and families in the Umatilla School District to secure basic resources such as food and clothing. So here you can hear from Abby. My name is Obdulia Munoz, but people know me by Abby. I live in Umatilla, Oregon, and I have lived here for the last 33 years. I work with migrant families and I love it. Um, I chose Umatilla because that's where my family was and where I raised my family too love the small community. Our families and communities have already lived three decades with water and air pollution from corporate agriculture. Our land is dry and sandy. Nitrates from irrigators and mega dairies have polluted our water. Some cities have spent more money to treat the water, but there are people who do not have the extra money to buy bottled or purified water and they drink well water, which can be contaminated. Allowing another mega dairy can do more harm without having fixed the initial problem. We do not believe this would be acceptable in other communities on the west side. We need to invest in our communities, we should not, but we should not have to continue to choose between good jobs, water, air, and our health. This pollution hurt, hurt us on top of the climate crisis and the wildfires of the last year. A moratorium will give us the chance to fix this three decade mess and not make the problem worse. Wow, wow, that was a really powerful video. And we really appreciate Abby sharing her experience and her community's experience and why a mega dairy moratorium would be important to protect her community from the further harms of these facilities. And I think it's really important um, to highlight as Abby's video did and Amy mentioned that the burden of these facilities um, that we're discussing tonight and are describing are not equally felt by all Oregonians. So like factory farms across the rest of the country, mega dairies in Oregon are disproportionately cited in low income and rural communities. And these are communities that are often black indigenous communities of color that struggle to have their voices heard by regulators. And as we continue to fight for an Oregon free of the harms of mega dairies, I think it's important we elevate the voices and experience of these communities that are next door to these facilities. And with that, I now like to turn it over to our special guest tonight, Representative Rob Nose. Representative Nose has been representing District 42 since 2014. He lives in Southeast Portland with his husband, Jim. They have two grown children and two grandchildren. And he has devoted his career to standing up for working people and helping to raise the bar for middle-class families. Until the summer of last year, Representative Nose also worked at Oregon Nurses Association where he worked to bring nurses together with a strong united voice to advocate for themselves and their patients. Now he is a full-time legislator. In the 2021 legislative session, Rep Nose is serving on the Joint Ways and Means Committee as a vice chair of the House Committee on Behavioral Health and as co-chair for the Joint uh, it's co-chair for the Joint Ways and Means Committee on Human Services as well. He is also the co-lead sponsor for House Bill 2924 that would put a moratorium on new and expanding mega dairies above 2,500 cows in Oregon. Welcome, uh, Rep Nose. Thank you very much for having me. It's nice to be here. And thanks for the advocacy that you and your, and your colleagues are, are bringing to this issue. Um, 
you know, I think, um, you know, until the pandemic uh, sort of took over everything, I feel like a lot of our life is a little bit trying to remember what it was like to live, um, you know, before we had to survive this. Um, climate change was the big major issue um, that this state and this country was trying to grapple with. I know President Trump was not trying to grapple with it, but everybody else in the United States knows that this is something we had to deal with. And agriculture done in this manner is only contributing to that problem. And so I'm delighted to be a part of this bill and um, try to put a moratorium in place um, so that we can stop this kind of farming practice and do something that helps workers and helps our climate as well. So thanks for the advocacy that you're doing. Thanks to all your uh, viewers and listeners that are here tonight who are willing to sort of step up and help advocate for this issue. It's, um, I mean, you all probably know this, but I cannot uh, accomplish this um, by myself. Um, it takes an organization and people reaching out to their legislator. And hopefully there are folks that are here from the Willamette Valley and from Southern Oregon and, and Central and Eastern Oregon as well who are willing to write to their state representatives and their state senators asking them to support this bill. Because um, if it's just a Portland thing, or if it's just a representative knows thing, we're not gonna be very successful. We've got to reach a lot of other people and do a lot of education if we're gonna pass this thing. The, the committee that it's in has people that I believe will be sympathetic to this issue and our cause, but there are also folks in that committee that will probably be sympathetic to these big factory farms as well. And so we're gonna to have to work really hard to try to get this push through. I don't know if there's anything else, Emma, that you wanted me to cover, or Amy or Rebecca, um, or is it Tara? I, I put my glasses on here. Hi, Tara. Um, I don't know if there's anything else that you wanted me to cover. Maybe there's questions people wanna ask, but I'm, I'm delighted uh, to work with you all on this. I also wanna just compliment your advocacy. Um, you and your team have done a really good job of keeping in touch with me all summer and fall. Uh, so that we roll into the session ready to go. Thank you, Repnos. And we just so appreciate your advocacy on this issue as well. Um, yes, we, we have a fight ahead of us, but I think when if we come together, we can, we can really make this happen. Um, so we are gonna get to some questions in a little bit. Um, I definitely have some, um, and it sounds like there's a lot of questions as well in the chat that we will get to. Um, but before that, I wanted to um, turn it over to our last speaker tonight, um, Tara Heinzen. And Tara uh, joined the Food and Water Watch Justice Program as a staff attorney in 2015 and is now the legal director. And before joining Food and Water Watch, Tara spent five years as an attorney at the Environmental Integrity Project, leading programs focused on enforcing laws that regulate factory farm water and air pollution and restoring the Chesapeake Bay. She graduated, she graduated cum laude with a certificate in environmental and natural resources law from Lewis and Clark Law School in 2009. And prior to law school, she spent two years as a grassroots organizer for the Sierra Club in Iowa, working to reduce factory farm pollution. Um, so Tara, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Great, thanks so much, Emma. And thank you, Repnos, for being here and for your leadership. And thanks everyone for participating tonight. I think it's clear from all of these presentations that now is the time for a mega dairy moratorium in Oregon, not just minor reforms that will allow factory farms to continue business as usual. We've heard how mega dairies cause a wide range of problems for the environment, family farmers, and rural communities. And I'm gonna talk briefly about how the state of Oregon has yet to seriously tackle these issues. First, despite the water pollution problems that Amy discussed, Oregon, like most states, allows these facilities to store just incredible amounts of waste in pits that we know can leach into groundwater and threaten public health. The state also allows mega dairies to dispose of this waste completely untreated on cropland, where again, we know that it can run off into surface waters, further threatening public health as well as aquatic ecosystems. This waste isn't just manure. This is an industrial product that contains antibiotics, other feed additives, heavy metals, and antibiotic resistant pathogens, but it's regulated like it's nothing more than beneficial fertilizer. The result is that the water pollution permits we have in place are not up to the challenge of protecting our rivers and streams. Megadairy water extraction is also under-regulated. 
These facilities are able to use incredible amounts of very scarce groundwater due to a loophole in state law for what's called stock watering. And this is a loophole that's exploited by the largest mega dairies. Amazingly, air pollution is even less regulated. The state has known for decades that the emissions from mega dairies, including ammonia, volatile organic compounds, particulate matter, and methane, harm public health, uh, threaten to impair visibility in the Columbia Gorge, and contribute to climate change. But the state has failed to implement even the most broadly supported recommendations that would begin restricting this pollution. The effect is that these emissions remain entirely unregulated. Allowing mega dairies to externalize these environmental harms onto communities also disadvantages family farmers, further tilting the playing field and making it harder for smaller and pasture-based operations to stay in business. This is why the industry and its supporters continue to repeat the false narrative that Lost Valley was just a lone bad actor and we won't see mega dairy harms again in the future. This distracts us from the reality that even the so-called best actor is contributing to these problems. Industry representatives often point to Three Mile Canyon in particular to argue that even a 70,000 cow mega dairy can be quote unquote sustainable. But simply complying with the laws on the books isn't meaningful when there are no protections or only very weak ones in place in the first place. Three Mile Canyon and other mega dairies that aren't constantly in the news for illegal pollution like Lost Valley was are still contributing to air pollution and climate change. And they still threaten groundwater, surface water, public health, and rural quality of life across the state as a result of the practices this industry uses and the scale of their operations. Citizens have repeatedly called on the state and US EPA to address these issues and have offered solutions to many of the problems we've identified. In 2016, thousands of Oregonians urged the state to reject the Lost Valley water pollution permit, or at the very least to strengthen it to better protect our waterways, but the state didn't listen. A petition to EPA calling for emergency action to address the nitrate pollution that Amy mentioned has gone unanswered for over a year and has not spurred the state to take stronger action to provide clean water for residents with contaminated drinking water or even to put the brakes on Easter Day's permit, which threatens to worsen this contamination. Another petition, this one to the Oregon Water Resources Board, intended to fix the stock watering exemption so that it's no longer available as a loophole for mega dairies in critical groundwater areas where Oregon's largest mega dairies are located was denied despite strong evidence that mega dairy water use in the area was contributing to its severe aquifer decline and could harm family farmers and other water users. And citizens also recently called on Governor Brown to include mega dairy air pollution emissions in her climate executive order and to require her agencies to regulate these emissions to the maximum extent allowed under state law, but nothing has been done. In short, calling on Oregon's agencies has failed to move us in the right direction. And it's long past time for strong legislative action to enact a moratorium until mega dairy's harmful impacts have been meaningfully addressed. So I hope you'll all join us in calling on your legislators to support this moratorium legislation this session. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Tara. Um, you're absolutely right. Uh, it's really the time for a mega dairy moratorium in Oregon. Um, it's clear there's a lot of risk um, in our environment and communities um, really need uh, our elected officials to take meaningful action to prevent these facilities from being permitted um, and uh, to help protect Oregon from these harms. So thank you so much. Um, if you have any questions for Tara, be sure to pop them in the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. And that concludes our speakers and we're gonna move into our Q&A here in a minute. But before we get into that, I do want to mention um, that we'll be circulating an email later this week and there will be an action to send a message directly to your legislators, urging them to co-sponsor the mega dairy moratorium bills in both the House and Senate. Um, these companion bills uh, would enact a moratorium on new and expanding mega dairies. And I really hope you can join us in showing our elected officials that Oregonians are ready to curb the harms of these industrial facilities and that it's really time for a, me a mega dairy moratorium. So be sure to watch out for that email and please share it with your family and friends and neighbors. And in the meantime, we do have a petition you can sign in support of a mega dairy moratorium um, here and now that we'll be placing in the chat. So please sign and share that petition as well. Well, great, let's uh, turn to some of your great questions. Um, so I'm, 
I'm gonna ask these questions of our speakers here tonight. <clears throat> and my first question um, is for Amy. Amy, um, how would a moratorium on new and expanding mega dairies help small and mid-sized farmers? Well, um, you know, as I spoke to earlier, the consolidation of the market and the you know, overproduction by big facilities is not helping small and mid-sized farmers compete because it's impossible to compete with that kind of economy of scale and you know, uh, externalizing cost, as I know I said, and, and Tara repeated, but it's really bears repeating uh, to make the milk cheap. Um, so now these you know, smaller dairies are feeling the pressure to get bigger and bigger herds in order just to stay in, you know, in the market. Um, so, you know, and the problem is from, from the consumer standpoint, even if smaller dairies are using better practices, it's not reflected in the price that you can get for conventional milk, unless you have other more expensive certifications like organic certification, for example, which there is, uh, there is a, a good uh, amount of organic dairy in Oregon, but that's basically the only way that a smaller uh, dairy can manage to get a fair price for their milk. So this moratorium would relieve some of that pressure um, from the you know keep getting bigger and bigger or the get bigger get out um, problem that we've seen. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, so Rep Nos, I was uh, hoping to ask you um, why is this an issue that is really important for all Oregonians? You touched on this a little bit. Um, in uh, when you were speaking, but I was hoping you could expand a little bit about why we should all be rallying, rallying around this issue. Well, you know, it, we live in a whole state, right? And our agricultural practices um, impact everybody that lives here. You know, um, climate change doesn't just, uh, you know, sort of limit itself to the metro area or to Eastern Oregon, but we experience it all over the state and all over the planet. And and frankly, I think Oregonians also, um, as a state, we tend to be pro-union. We believe in workers' rights. We believe in, in environmental regulation. You know, we're the state that did the bottle bill. We're the state that has strong, the strongest land use planning laws when it, in the United States. And, and so, you know, what happens in one part of the state impacts other parts. Thank you, Rep Nose. Um, and, and I think also, frankly, if we want to, if we want a more sustainable agriculture for dairy farmers um, in this part of the state, you know, on the wet side, we have to promote it on the dry side as well. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, you know, this is where we, this whole past year has been a lesson in how interconnected we all are. Um, and I think the same is, is very true for um, agriculture in our state. So thank you. Um, Tara, I wanted to ask, um, it seems like passing these bills in banning factory farms will be really hard. Um, so why not fight for something that is more politically possible, like better regulations or enforcement? It's a great question. I mean, I think it's our job to change what's politically possible to build the power that we need to hold our legislators accountable and to build a consensus around the need for strong, bold action. We know that big ag is extremely politically powerful and we know that these are really hard fights. But, and speaking in particular for Food and Water Watch, we believe in fighting for what we really want and really need. And we've decided with a broad coalition of stakeholders concerned about a huge range of issues that what Oregon really needs is a moratorium. Strong regulations for existing factory farms is also very important and I don't wanna dismiss that, but we threaten to make the problem even worse if we prioritize that first instead of a moratorium. And if we have a moratorium in place, then we can focus on the reforms that we need to address all of the many problems this industry causes and see if we can reach a point where there's justification to lift that moratorium. But right now the state hasn't really done anything meaningful to address these problems and there's a lot of work to be done. Thank you, Tara. And a quick follow up to that, someone in the chat um, was hoping you could list all of the agencies that um, you mentioned the Safe Drinking Water Act petition, the stock watering exemption, if you could just list those again for everyone. Um, sure. So the um, stock watering petition was to the Oregon Resources, Oregon Water Resources Department, and that was recently denied. The Safe Drinking Water Act petition was a petition to the US, the Federal Environmental Protection Agency. 
but we also were hoping that that would get the state's attention and get the State Department of Environmental Quality and Oregon Health Authority to take stronger action to protect public health as well. Thank you, Tara. Um, so I'm going to go back to Amy here. Um, could you talk a little bit, uh, you know, how this the COVID-19 pandemic we've been experiencing for almost a year now has um, impacted the need for a mega dairy mor moratorium? Sure. And I saw a question from um, one of my favorite members of our <laughs> organization to this uh, to this uh, effect as well about, you know, we're in a pandemic. How does this how do these facilities contribute to that? So I'm going to start there, which is that, you know, COVID-19 is a zoonotic disease. It means it came from animals. And those kinds of diseases are absolutely bred at factory farms. I mean, probably we all remember swine flu as well. You know, and, it, and it, this happens because, you know, animals are crowded together. So they're more able to spread disease. Um, conditions are, are, you know, not as healthy as being able to go outside and be in the sun and be on the grass. And, um, you know, there's a lot of drugs that are used to try to prevent, uh, you know, this disease in, in a kind of prophylactic manner, but that then can breed these more resistant type of bugs, as Tara mentioned, antibiotic resistant bugs. So the truth is that these facilities could very well be harboring the next pandemic. And um, so that is a very good reason to uh, put, a, put a pause on them uh, while we deal with the effects of this one. And I will say also like in a more broad way in terms of our food system, you know, what we learned from this pandemic, I think is that, you know, our food system isn't just, and it's not resilient and as regional and, and um, as able to be pivoted quickly, um, I guess flexible is a word you might use for that, as we need. You know, we saw how overproduction is happening when there was milk dumping happening at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and then the communities that are most impacted by COVID are also the ones that are most impacted by mega dairies. So you have this just worsening of environmental justice um, injustices happening and when folks are dealing with this underlying health and long latent nitrate caused health impacts that are not necessarily immediately obvious. And then, and then this bug um, that's, a, that's an absolute killer and disproportionately of um, you know, BIPOC uh, Oregonians. So, you know, all, for all those reasons, uh, it makes it clear that we that we need the moratorium now. And um, as we have a new facility coming in, there's just really no time to waste. Thank you, Amy. And you all are asking so many good questions in the chat. I don't think we'll be able to get to them all, um, but thank you so much for, for asking them. Um, so I wanted to turn to Tara again. Um, Tara, Mega dairies, uh, Amy's talked about this a little bit more, but mega dairies seem to be concentrated in Oregon's rural communities. And there's been a couple questions in the chat about sort of where the communities that are most impacted stand on this issue. Um, and these communities tend to not have a lot of political power. So the question is, as advocates, how do we ensure that rural communities are part of any legislative solution for these facilities? That's a great question and it's always tough to answer, but one thing we're prioritizing in our organizing, which is really hard as Emma mostly knows, because this is mostly her work, um, really hard, particularly during the pandemic, is that we're prioritizing building relationships in these frontline communities so that we can learn from folks directly about their needs, their priorities. And we're also following the lead of organizational partners like Oregon Rural Action, um, of which Abby, who we heard from, is a member. And those are groups that are building grassroots power in these areas and are really leading on these issues. So trying to make sure that we are amplifying their voices and listening to their priorities and needs and following their lead, I think is a really important way forward to make sure that those communities' needs are addressed directly to the legislature. I mean, one thing we heard from Abby is that these communities are often told that they have to choose between jobs and the environment. And we know that that's a false choice and that our legislators need to start listening to that message and understand that no one in Oregon, no matter where they live, should have to choose between jobs and the environment that they live in. Thank you, Tara. Uh, yeah, it's, um, you mentioned that it's, it's 
can be challenging in the pandemic to work with, um, you know, get in touch and work with the communities directly. And so I feel like we're really lucky as um, part of the Stand Up to Factory Farms Coalition, having groups that are working directly in the community out there, um, Oregon Rural Action, um, Columbia Riverkeeper, um, that are really, uh, you know, working directly with the most impacted uh, residents. Um, so I wanted to ask a really quick question, actually, Tara, I'm going to stay on you, um, about biogas. And we didn't really talk about this very much, but I think this is something that comes up a lot in um, discussions around mega dairy sustainability. So I wanted to ask you, um, will manure digesters clean up factory farm pollution? It's a good question. We've been hearing a lot lately about quote unquote, renewable natural gas and how digesters can capture the climate change causing methane from these facilities and prevent it from contributing to climate change while creating what they're portraying as renewable clean energy. But the reality is that only half or probably less than half of the methane from these facilities is actually captured in a digester. And these schemes are often heavily incentivized and subsidized by the state and various federal programs. So it once again is a way that we are incentivizing the mega dairy model and prioritizing this model to the detriment and disadvantage of more sustainable family farms with animals on pasture that don't manage manure in a way that causes these emissions in the first place. So I think it's really a false solution that doesn't address the water pollution issues. It leaves a lot of climate change emissions unaddressed and it will likely spur the expansion of what we know is an inherently dirty and unsustainable industry by creating incentives for them to install this equipment and then sell this supposed renewable natural gas into markets to send it to California and other places. So I think it's, it's often being put forth as a solution, but we always know that these problems are much more complicated than solutions like that are capable of addressing. So it's kind of a a band-aid solution to a much more um, complicated problem. Thank you, Tara. Um, Amy, I wanted to turn it over you, to you again really quick um, to ask the question, could we get rid of mega dairies if we just stopped buying milk from them? No. Um, while, you know, it, it's a great idea to find out where your milk and dairy products are coming from and uh, we certainly can't just uh, vote with our dollar. I mean, one, that's a, a luxury uh, privileged thing to be able to do, but you know, what we really need is big systemic change. And the only way we can do that is to vote with our actual votes and, um, and engage with our representatives like uh, representative knows here and uh, you know, demand that they protect <laughs> Oregonians from these, from these facilities. And if I can stay on and answer another question, we have time. So um, it was asked, what are the labor issues at um, industrial mega dairies? And, you know, can people be made sick? And are there labor rights issues? Um, answer to that is absolutely. But as another um, participant put in the chat, this is actually a problem at dairies of all size. Um, and so, you know, some of these issues are in terms of you know, uh, wage theft, overtime, assaults, these kinds of terrible things happening, but also the, uh, you know, manure lagoons that uh, can, you know, the, we talked about the noxious gases that come off of them like hydrogen sulfide, which can kill you. Um, and deaths happen every year at these types of facilities. Um, not necessarily every year in Oregon, but across the country. So I think it's very important to recognize that. Um, but that, uh, you know, so that this is a problem that is, is true of, of many dairies and um, something that as a coalition that we do want to work to address more. Um, and, you know, the issue with mega dairies being all the other problems that they cause with having so much manure in one place and the environmental issues and the public health issues there. So just wanted to call that out and thank the people for their questions and, and, and helpful information on that front. Thank you, Amy. Um, well, Rep Nos, I wanted to turn to you here as we sort of wrap up our Q and A. There's there's a ton more questions, um, but um, 
I wanted to ask as a legislator, what are some helpful ways constituents can support you in fighting for a mega dairy moratorium? So the first thing we've got to do is get, um, I believe the, the bill is probably in the Agriculture and Natural Resources Committee of the Oregon House. Amy, does that sound right? You're nodding. Yes. I mean, I don't know what other committee, it could have gone to Energy and Environment, I suppose, but that would be the appropriate would, policy committee. Yep. So we, the first thing we've got to do is get Representative Brad Witt to agree to have a hearing. Um, so any of you that live in the Scapoose, St. Helens, um, you know, that part of, of Oregon, a little bit, he's got a little sliver of Multnomah County. If any of you are on the call tonight, you know, and his constituent, um, you know, just send a quick email or make a quick phone call to his office and ask for a hearing. And it certainly won't hurt that other folks do it from around the state, but as legislators, we tend to be most responsive uh, to our constituents, to our actual voters. So if you've got folks from that area, um, there's also other members of the committee, um, and maybe there's a way via the chat to somehow quickly flash up who the members are on the committee. I don't know if that's a thing we can do here before we've got to be done, but if you go to the Oregon State Legislature and you look up the Agricultural and Natural Resources Committee in the House, you can look for the members of that committee. Maybe some of your listeners are members of the, um, their representative is a member of that committee. And then they can certainly reach out to Representative Witt and say, I like this bill. I think this is a good idea. We should at least give it a hearing um, and do it in a friendly way. And um, this is still a small state. And most of my colleagues, Democrat or Republican, you know, are happy to entertain an, entertain an idea, even if they're not sure about it or they don't know a lot about it. And that's what a hearing is designed to do. So that's the, I think that's the main thing that we've got to do is, is get people interested in having a hearing. And behind the scenes, I'll certainly talk to Representative Witt myself. Thanks, Rep. Nose. And um, we'll we'll get uh, that list up there about the House Ag Committee here in just a moment. Um, the House Agriculture and Natural Resources Committee. Um, Brad Witt is the chair, Representative Witt. Um, so uh, we are going to start wrapping up. And I know there's so many more questions. Um, we can hopefully get to them either written um, or at a later date. We are going to be following up. Um, with uh, everyone via email um, to provide resources about next steps. Um, I uh, just wanted to thank so much um, the speakers here tonight and you all for your thoughtful questions and um, the discussion we had here. And um, following on the heels of Repnos's, uh, how do we get involved? Um, I wanted to share a few more ways um, that you can get involved as well. Um, and helping to make a Megadory moratorium a reality for Oregon. So as I mentioned, tomorrow you will receive an email with a link to send a message to your legislators asking them to co-sponsor a mega dairy moratorium. Um, not only do we need to get a hearing um, for these bills in the House Agriculture um, and Natural Resources Committee and the Senate um, Energy and Environment Committee, but we also need co-sponsors. We need um, to show our elected officials that this is really important and we want them to sign on and, um, and fight for this as well. So please send a message when we share that link with you and um, share that link with uh, three friends to send a message as well. Um, let's get a really good turnout on this. Um, and it's really important to show our elected officials uh, as we've been talking about the broad support for a mega dairy moratorium across Oregon. Um, and one of the ways you can do that is you can write a letter to the editor. Um, we actually have a training video to do just that. And I'll also be sending the link out tomorrow in that email as well. So you can watch a short 10 minute video about how to write a really good letter to the editor and we can start getting this um, this issue into our local papers, uh, which will help it get wider eyes and a wider audience. Um, you can also um, call on your elected officials um, directly. Uh, they have phone numbers, you can leave voice messages. Um, uh, as Rep Nose mentioned, I think they like to hear from us, our, their constituents. Um, and you can also share on social media why you support a mega dairy moratorium and tag your elected officials um, as well so that they get to see that. Um, and really just another way that I wanted to share that's I think is kind of undervalued sometimes, but a great way to support a mega dairy moratorium is to simply talk with your friends and family about why a mega dairy moratorium is important to protect our community's environment. 
Um, so you can really think about why you support a mega dairy moratorium. Is it the climate or small farmers or animal welfare, or rural communities? There's so many reasons to care about this issue. Um, and there's so many reasons that it's critical and important um, for Oregon right now. Um, and really it's up to you to, to spread the word uh, with the people you know about why this matters. So those are some of the ways we can, uh, you can get involved. Um, we're gonna be sharing um, all of those in a follow-up email to you all. But I just wanted to give a huge thank you to Representative Nose for joining us tonight to speak to the importance of this critical legislation. I wanna give a big thank you to our other speakers tonight, Amy Van Son and Tara Heinzen for sharing their knowledge. Um, thanks to Oregon Rural Action and Abby Munoz for sharing the experience of those living with mega dairies. And thank you to the Stand Up to Factory Farms Coalition members, um, those wonderful groups uh, that we shared at the beginning. Um, if you wanna learn more about the Stand Up to Factory Farms uh, Coalition, uh, you can go to standuptofactoryfarms.org. Um, you can learn all about uh, what we're doing and how we're working for a mega dairy moratorium in Oregon. Um, so uh, I wanted to thank all of you for joining us tonight. Um, I think we'll get those uh, committee names to you all in the email. Oh, perfect. Um, thank you, <laughs> Rebecca. Um, they're right over there, the current membership. We have, um, uh, uh, actually that that is, oh yes it is, no, it's, uh, Brad Witt, yep, wonderful. So um, those, are, those are the members. Um, so reach out to them, um, identify who your legislators are and give them a, give them a call or send them a message um, to uh, get a hearing. And, and I'll um, just say, um, yes. not to interrupt, but like there's, there's definitely people that are supportive of this issue on that committee. We have, we have allies. Wonderful, thank you, Repnos. That's really good to hear. Um, yeah, so um, also I wanted to uh, just give a quick thank you to Senator Dembro for introducing the uh, mega dairy moratorium in the Senate. It's really lovely to have um, moratoriums in both the House and the Senate this year. Um, and finally, I wanna thank all of you for joining us tonight and I want, you, want to urge all of you to join us in this movement. Uh, look out for my email uh, with more information about how you can take action and thank you again for joining us tonight. I hope everyone stays safe and well.